Good morning. Good morning, Stockton campus, and uh, good morning those watching on our online campus. Um, open your Bibles with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We'll be there shortly, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, while you're going there, and especially if you've been absent some this month and didn't understand what was happening just then, um, we've started a new partnership that every month will change, but um, basically the concept is we check in, we do good, okay? So check in, do good is kind of the idea. And um, so last month it was shoes with a with an organization called Souls for Souls. And uh, so last month it was ten check ins equaled one pair of shoes to someone who didn't have shoes. So the Staunton campus or the Carville campus did 156 shoes. We we gave 156 pairs of shoes. Our check ins allowed for that. Um, the Staunton campus was 54 pairs of shoes. So ch- cross church total was 210 pairs of shoes that were given to people who didn't have shoes. Um, And with our nationwide partners, it was 12,421 pairs of shoes to children who didn't have shoes. That's a big deal. Um, Now, so to me, that's how I think about it. So that's 10 check-ins equaled one pair of shoes, okay? Uh, This month, it's one check-in equals one week of clean drinking water for a family. So one check-in, not 10, not five, one. Because every month will be a different scenario, okay, based on who the partner is and that kind of stuff. But So one check-in. So some people, I realize this is, I know <clears throat> there are people who are on Facebook, because this is a Facebook, you have people on Facebook do this. There are people on Facebook who don't know how to check in, okay? That's not, don't be embarrassed by that. Because no one knew how to check in at some point in time, then they learned, right? So everybody had to learn. So if you don't know how to check in, then ask, because you learned how to check in. If you just checked in one time that week, that's a week of clean drink water for somebody, right? So you can check in every 12 hours. So twice a day, basically, you can check in, okay? Uh, you don't have to be at the campus to do that. You can be, uh, like this morning from my office, I checked into the Carnville campus, and I checked into the Staunton campus. So I checked in twice this morning. So by myself, I've already provided two weeks of clean drinking water for someone or for a family, okay? So you can be at home, you can be in Florida, you can be watching us right now on the internet from Alaska, wherever you wanna be at, okay? And you can check in. You can check in on Tuesday afternoon, you can check in on Thursday night at 12 o'clock, whenever you wanna check in, check in, because it's providing clean drinking water. And you don't have to be a member of our church, even you know, friends that you have wanna check in, they can check in because it's providing how many weeks of clean drinking water? And how many check-ins are required for that? Okay. So you can get your phones out now. You can check in. Check in this week, whatever you want to do. And um, take a picture, whatever that may be. All right. Um, so we're in a series, and we'll be there all summer long, titled One Simple Truth. And the idea is, is that we'll, the title of the, the message for that week will be The One Simple Truth. Okay? The one thing that you just really know. So today's One Simple Truth is God's grace is always enough. God's grace is always enough. Uh, grace, there's lots of different ways to understand grace. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, like a lot of times the definition would be it's God's unmerited favor, okay? The people use that kind of terminology. How many of you have ever used the word unmerited in your entire life? You know what I'm saying? It's like, it, what it means is, is that like mercy is when God doesn't give us the punishment we deserve. That's, that's mercy, God shows mercy to us, but he didn't destroy us because of our sin. And grace is when God gives us what we don't deserve. That's basically what that means, okay? So when God shows grace, it's God's giving us stuff we don't deserve. All right. Then there's the sense of grace of God's already provided grace, and he sent Jesus Christ down the cross, okay? He's provided grace, and he's forgiven our sin. He's provided grace, and he, he's no longer holding this, our sin against us, but he's reconciled us back to himself in Christ. Those are ways that grace has already been established and given, and we walk in grace every day, whether we recognize it or not. The people who don't believe in God are walking in God's grace on any given day, okay? So there's that kind of grace. Today, I want to talk about grace as it relates to kind of the individual-specific deal you're walking through today, so it's more in the moment grace rather than in the, you know, kind of the global sense of God already gave us grace to cross, okay? Because some people think that, well, God's grace is for the cross and God's already provided us grace and if we receive God's grace and, you know, like songs like Amazing Grace, right? It's all talking about what God did to cross and that's all true. But God's grace is not just for what happened at the cross and for the forgiveness of my sin and I get to go to heaven someday and be with God. God's grace is also for the struggle that I'm walking through right now. 
So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, this is Paul, who's right, and we've talked about this spring, we spent some time with some of Paul's story, and you know, he's the guy who used to be called Saul, that um, you know, he was the one who was killing Christians, and was, uh, met Jesus on the road to, uh, to, to go kill more Christians, and he was blinded for three days, and that, that's, that was that guy, right? So this is him, he's talking to a church in a town called Corinth, and that church was really messed up. And he was trying to explain some things to him. So I'm going to pick up verse 7, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. Um, and he's been explaining a lot of things about this vision and about how, I mean, what you have to know about Paul is, uh, Paul was a highly educated um, person. He was a Pharisee. He was one of the religious leaders of their day. Uh, he was one of the leaders of all the Pharisees. Okay, he's kind of a big deal. He was the guy who was the he was the lead dog in the persecution of the early church. If you go back to early in Acts, okay, he was he was a big deal. Now he is you know because he met Christ. Now he's a church planter and a missionary, and he's spreading the gospel wherever he goes. Right. So that's who Paul is. And so Paul he started a church in a town called Corinth, and now they appointed elders in the church in. Corinth, and now he's communicating back to them. And he's, he, he just had said in the first six verses about, you know, listen, I could tell you and I could brag a little bit and I could tell you how awesome I was and things like that and what God's done, but I'm not going to, all right? So I'm actually picking up in the middle of a, of a, of a <laughs> statement, but I'll, I'll do that. Verse seven, or because of these surpassingly great revelations. And he's just saying by that, he's just saying that I recognize that God has done some pretty cool stuff in my life and that he's given me some really awesome revelations, okay? Surpassingly great re re revelations. So he's saying, I don't want you to be impressed by that. So he's getting ready to say something negative now. Therefore, in order to keep me from being, uh, becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in my weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecution, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. All right, so Paul was... Just commenting, he was just saying to them, listen, I could tell you all kinds of cool stuff. And I could brag a little bit about how awesome it's been, but here's the situation. The situation is, is that um, God has given me what he calls a thorn in my flesh um, to keep me from being conceited. Like, as cool as that was, <laughs> I know about my weaknesses. As awesome as, I mean, you saw this and that was really cool, but you don't understand my struggle. You don't understand my whatever it is. And people, scholars, whoever, they've tried to come up with a little forever about what this thorn in the flesh was, right? And we could debate that all day long. It could be some area of sin. It could be some kind of thing like a depression or whatever. I mean, people can just say what they want to say. Nobody knows. So anyone who says, well, the thorn in the flesh is, and they have a thing they say, they don't know. Okay? It could be anything, right? Um... A thorn in your flesh. I mean, we, and back in the old days, I don't know if people use that anymore, but I remember back in the old days, you remember hearing the old people say things like, well, that's just a thorn in my flesh. Okay, and they, I guess they were talking about this passage of scripture, but they were talking about some nuisance in their life. They weren't actually talking about, you know, something that Satan did. They were talking about some nuisance in their life, some kind of frustration. Your thorn in your flesh could be, you know, something that, um, you know, it's a health issue, it's, a, it's an ongoing something or other, it's a financial issue, some kind of struggle you're having at work, or it's a, whatever, it could be all kinds of things for individual people, okay? It's just the, the struggle that you have. All right. Number one, the outline. Thorns come in two basic sources, or from. Thorns come from two basic sources, the enemy and life. The enemy and life. In this case... Paul was saying that this messenger from Satan, he called it, was given to me by God, and where God allowed that to happen, okay? And he said, the reason God allowed this to happen was to keep me humble, okay? And um, he would say, because if I didn't have that going on, I could be, you know, it'd be easy for me to become conceited because I've had these surpassing great revelations. Um, I... 
I'm highly esteemed by some people and I'm highly hated by other people. And um, God uses me to plant all these different churches and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the, the missionary that goes around all these different places and I'm seeing all these people come to Christ and I'm, I'm seeing all these things take place and, and I'm the one that is doing all these different kind of things. And I could be really conceited, but just to keep me from being conceited, God has given me this messenger, this thorn in my side or flesh, this thing that keeps me reminded that um, I'm a flawed and broken person. Okay? Well, that's the kind that comes from Satan, and that, that can happen, and that does happen. Um, things that you think, well, why does God allow that to take place? Like, why does God allow spiritual warfare? Okay, so, just, you know, I mean, it's kind of a, a just as the true statement, that as God works in your life, Satan wants to stop that. Satan doesn't want a church to grow, for instance. Satan doesn't want you to change. He doesn't want you to actually live a transformed life. Like, you know, when I talk about the problem in, you know, normal churches and, and things like that, and as great as what we would say we are and all that kind of stuff, we're so grateful for whatever, we're nowhere near where we need to be. Don't misunderstand that. I mean, if you weren't sharing your faith this week, then we got a problem. If you don't plan on giving financially, we got a problem. If you don't plan on serving, we got a problem. If you don't spend time in your word, the word, the scripture this week, if you weren't in life groups and small groups this week, if you weren't engaged in the mission from Sunday through the next Sunday, if you weren't engaged in the mission someplace, I mean, so don't, don't get confused that, well, the church is doing good and we have multiple campuses and we got this, we got technology and we got what a handsome pastor and things like that. Don't get confused by those things, okay? That does not mean everything's okay. I mean, like I, I learned a long time ago, if you're the fastest turtle, you're still slow. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, our goal is not to be the fastest turtle. Our goal is not to be the whatever church in a, a certain area or a certain region. Our goal is to do the very best we can to love God and love people in a way that honors God. That we want to serve. That we want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. All those kind of phrases. We, we want to look at the Bible and look at the church and see the same thing. And until we get there, there's a problem. So if you compare ourselves to someone else... Well, our church is growing, or our church is this. Oh, yeah, okay. But nowhere in scriptures that say a church should compare itself to another church. Nowhere does it say a Christian should compare themselves to the other Christian. That's not how it works. We haven't baptized for, I don't know, three or four weeks now. Hmm. Is that because there's no one who needs Jesus? Or is that because there's people who need Jesus, we just didn't tell them about Jesus? Smiley face. You get that? Okay, so don't get confused by this. What he's saying is, is that there are times that Satan gives, that God allows Satan to keep somebody from being conceited or a church from being conceited to give them some kind of struggle. And as a general rule, whatever I can tell you, is that if churches aren't growing, if individual believers are not growing, being transformed, experiencing the presence of God, there is a problem. Always is a problem. If Satan doesn't want you to come to Christ because he wants you to spend eternity in hell, but if you're going to get saved, if you're going to give your life to Jesus, then he doesn't want you to be transformed because the best thing he, you know, it's like he would rather you have it be a poster child for, okay, here's what a Christian looks like, just like everyone else in the world. He doesn't want you to walk in victory and grace and the power and authority of a risen Savior. He wants you to walk in defeat. He wants you to walk in struggle. He wants you to walk in doubt. He wants you to walk in shame. Because if the person without Jesus walks in doubt and fear and shame, and the person with Jesus walks in doubt and fear and shame, what's the difference? He wants you to keep struggling with your addiction he wants your marriage to keep fighting, whatever the thing is, right? And the point is, he doesn't want you to experience transformation. That's the point. 
So many times, since we don't even think of warfare, that's a, something that God's allowed, that many times that's what it is. I mean, like when a church, and early on in our church, um, you know, I, these are concerts we had had. We don't have to worry about so much today, but back then we did. You know, um, like in a business meeting, okay? A business meeting in the church, some of you don't know what that is, uh, is where the church gathers to vote on some topic, okay? And a lot of more traditional churches or churches they do it every month or whatever the case is, you'd gather. And uh, so we're going to vote on what we're going to vote on. And how it's, it's always set up is we're supposed to go by this book called Robert's Rules of Order. That's the parliamentary procedures, okay? Okay, now how that's set up is, just in a, ver- in a very general sense is, is that somebody stands up and says, we want to make the carpet blue. Before anyone else can talk about we're for blue carpet, I need to have, and so I need to ask, is there anyone against blue carpet? I'm asking for conflict. You see what I'm saying? Hello, anybody have for blue carpet? Okay. Oh, I got a red carpet. Okay, great. Okay, now the blue carpet people can speak again. And the blue carpet people say, well, I want blue carpet because it's my favorite color. Okay, is there anyone against blue carpet who would like to speak? That's how parliamentary procedures work. Does that sound at all like Scripture? No. It doesn't, does it? That is written into almost every church's bylaws at some point in place. Their, their, their governing procedures is that that's how we operate. We operate by parliamentary procedures as governed in Robert's Rules of Order. And I say, listen, Mr. Roberts may be a nice guy, but he did not die for my sins. Right? His book may be really popular, but his book is not alive and living and sharper than any two-edged sword like Scripture is. Scripture is our sole authority for faith and practice, what we believe and what we do, not someone else's book, no matter how great it is. That makes sense to everybody? Yes? Okay. Well, just a simple thing like that. Church is living in conflict all over the place. Because somewhere, someone, I'm not talking about ever how many decades ago, ever how many you know, centuries ago, someone someplace said, well, to govern the business of the church, we should use parliamentary procedures. You do know that government uses those, right? <laughs> right? And you do know that they're messed up all the time. And you do know that there's always conflict. Someone thought it'd be a really good idea for the church to look just like that. So, somewhere, back whenever, some brilliant person who was hearing the voice of Satan, not the voice of God, said, you know, instead of going by Scripture when it comes time to do business of the church, we should go by Robert's Rules of Order and Parliamentary Procedure. And everybody said, hear, hear, great idea. Let's all vote on that. All for it. And decades later, centuries later, whatever it's been, that's how churches operate. Satan doesn't have to stir up conflict. We beg for it. And people are terrified to simply back up and stand on what the scripture says rather than what their traditions say. Remember, if we go back to last week's message, if you weren't here, you might all go listen to that one. That our traditions have nullified the word of God. I think that's in Matthew 15. That our traditions, our human traditions, have nullified the word of God. Now, I can give you that story. I just use one example. I can give that story lots of different times. Okay. Then there's also, that's, you know, there's this life. Life happens, okay? Um, it's a thorn of flesh. So, you know, a lot of you have been here for a long time. Uh, so my left knee uh, has, is, has it had knee replacement, right? I had knee surgery uh, a couple years ago. So my left knee had knee replacement. So several years before that, I mean, I limped, and it's all I could do to walk some days and to stand up here. I mean, there was a period of time where me just standing, like, um, it, I have a really high threshold of pain. Um, and um, I, I don't know, whatever. It, it was all I could do to stand for two minutes at a time. Like, that's when we started, if you remember when the stool came out for the first time, the stool wasn't there to look cool. The stool was there because Tim could hang on about two minutes, he'd go sit down. (laughs) 
Okay? So I'd sit there for a while, then I'd get up and say something, I'd go sit down for a while. I wasn't trying to be cool. I was just trying to get some pressure off my left knee. Okay? Now, I can pray all I want to, and people prayed for my knee, and there are people who thought, okay, I had people who wanted my knee to be healed, which would be great, right? And people prayed for my knee, and my knee didn't get healed. Okay? So in this case, Paul saying, you know, I got this problem. And his thorn of the flesh could have been something like that. I don't know what it was. Okay, we, it, we, we don't know what his thorn of the flesh was. It could have been emotional. It could have been physical. It could have been financial. It could have been in some area of sin. I don't know what it was. But he was just saying, listen, I got a problem here, and I can't get past it. Well, I don't care how many people pray for my knee. And I always thought it was funny because it's like somebody prays for my knee. The question is, did God not heal me because of my lack of faith, your lack of faith, or just because he didn't want to? Because that's the way the thing is. If you have enough faith, God will heal you. No, I don't think that's true. And here's an example. Paul had plenty of faith. He died for his faith. He was in prison for his faith. All those kind of things. He prayed three times, God, would you take this away? And God said, no, I'm not going to. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to. Sometimes just life happens, though, right? Satan not give me a bad knee. I have had many life experiences that created a bad knee. And then as a younger person who, if they had engaged their knee pain and stiffness and whatever earlier, may not have had to have a surgery because maybe, you know, they could have done whatever to it. I was raised to believe that, you know, you just suck it up, rub some dirt on it, and keep going. Okay? That doctors are somehow evil, and you have to stay away from them. Okay? Which I still kind of stay away from doctors as much as I can. And so my knee could have been deteriorated because of my choices. Does that make sense to you? Had nothing to do with Satan. Just life. Life happens. Just because you lose your job don't mean Satan did that. Just because you have a financial struggle doesn't mean Satan did that. Just because you have a health issue doesn't mean Satan did that. Just because you have a relational issue doesn't mean Satan did that. Okay? Because you have some kind of thing, whatever that thing is that you would call a thorn in the flesh of any kind, right? That nuisance in your life, that ongoing struggle, it doesn't mean Satan did it. Sometimes Satan, it's Satan, that God allows that thing for a purpose. But other times it's just life happens. Okay? Number two in the outline, every thorn has a purpose and a lesson. Every thorn has a purpose and a lesson. Now, okay, so the message out of this passage, but I want to take you back to Mark chapter 4. I talk about about Mark chapter 4 periodically. Um, uh, I want to show you where the thorn is in here. So there's the kind of thorns that Paul's talking about in this passage. I'm coming right back to this passage, by the way, so keep your finger there. Um, there's the kind of thorn God's, uh, Paul's talking about in this passage that's a, a messenger from Satan. Go with me to Mark chapter 4, and there's a thorn that's more the kind that comes from life, and it's like this. So this is Jesus, and he gives the parable of the sower. And again, if you haven't read this, it's 20 verses, verses 1 through 20. You can read those later. But in verse 7, he describes in the parable part, um, he describes the word of God, and he says, um, other seed fell on the thorns, among the thorns, and grew up and choked out the plants so they did not bear much grain. Now, what he's saying is, is that the thorns of life, and he's not talking about Satan, he's talking about just life happening, right? He's saying that the seed, that's the word of God, is planted, okay? And it's received, and the plant begins to grow. And then it's saying that the, the thorns of life choke it out so it doesn't actually do anything, it doesn't produce any fruit. It might even be there, but it doesn't produce fruit. That's, what, that, that, that's kind of the picture it's given, right? With verse 18, Mark 4, verse 18, or 17, 18. Verse 18 and 19, he kind of explains that in his explanation of his parable. Still others, like the seeds, sown among the thorns. They hear the word. But the worries of this life, and now he's giving you some thorns, okay? The worries of this life. The deceitfulness of wealth. The desires for other things come in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. Now, this is Jesus talking, not Paul. And what Jesus is saying is, is that when our life is not fruitful, as a, as a follower of Christ, we should bear fruit. If our life is not being fruitful, if you're not seeing the evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you're not seeing God do things in your life, all those kind of things, then there's probably a reason, and maybe there's a seed that is growing. You have salvation, in other words. The word of God has planted in you, and you have the plant, but it's not being fruitful because of, and he names a few, but the thorns around you, they're choking it out. 
and you know the ones he gave this not like an exhaustive list obviously but just think about how these the entities apply to you the worries of this life i mean do the worries of life choke out the word of god doubt fear anxiety things like that getting all stressed out about whatever you're stressed out about and not trusting god not walking in trust and surrender and obedience words like that the deceitfulness of wealth Money's not evil. There's no problem with money. Money's fine. It's the love of money that's the problem. The deceitfulness of wealth, what that means is, sometimes we think if I had more money, everything would be okay. If I just had more money, whatever it is would be fixed. If I just had more money, whatever it is would go away. The deceitfulness of wealth, see, if you remember last week, one of the things I said was is that anything we put in the place of Jesus is wrong. At the end of the day, it's wrong, right? So, if I think that somehow if I had more money, I'd be okay, that I'm putting money in the place of Jesus. If I just was more wealthy, if I just had a bigger this or more of that, and I'd be better off, you know, that's not what it says. I mean, scripturally speaking, Jesus is first. What you need is Jesus, and everything else is, you know, if you, I mean, if you go back to Matthew 6, right? Seek first God, his way of doing things, his kingdom, his way of doing things, and all the other details will be taken care of too. Wow, that's really hard for us to believe, right? But that passage is right in the middle of a, of a topic of the, the conversations about worry. That's what in the middle of, it's about worry and money. That's what we're talking about in that, in that passage when it's written. And the desire for other things, other distractions. Like, I mean, I love Jesus, but I need, you know how we do that sometimes? What it says in that passage, in other words, is that those things come in and they choke out the word of God. Here's how I would describe it to you. There are the things we believe in our head to be true. But when you look in our individual lives, you don't see that being true. If I believe something to be true... I'm not talking about a fact like, you know, math or, you know, historical facts or whatever. I'm talking about scripturally speaking and the word of God and things like that. But yet, I don't practice that. It's not my life. There's a high possibility that a thorn in some form is choking out that thing in me. If you think about the word of God, and, and I wrestle some of this stuff all the time about, you know, um, I mean, technically speaking, we've created this environment where I speak forever how long, and you know, that's what pastors do, they speak, and then blah, blah, blah. Okay. And, and hopefully that the Holy Spirit communicates to you and all those kind of things, and that's how we want to be. But technically speaking, let's just say I say 10 things, okay? And you catch none of them. Just kind of water off the duck's back, as they say. It was a waste of both of our times. Does that make sense to you? If I say 10 things and you catch one of them, or if I say one thing and you catch it, right? So if I talk for 45 minutes and say 10 things, or if I talk for three minutes and say just one thing. So I say it, you got it. The seed is planted. You're protecting it. You're keeping it away from the, your, your heart's right, your head's right. You're keeping it away from the, you know, you're keeping it cultivated and you're keeping the, the weeds and the thorns cleared out, right? I mean, if you use that Mark 4 passage. Wouldn't we all be better off with a three-minute message with one truth that you caught and then applied in your life and protected. Just think about that for a second. If I got up and said, today's message is um, we should surrender to God. And you said, got it. And then you surrender to God. You need me to explain to you how many times he has all surrendered to God? And, and you know what I'm saying? 
The problem is that there's this thing where we're struggle. We, <sighs> explain me again why I gotta do that? Say it in a way that it makes sense to me? Help me understand that? All those kind of things we do sometimes, right? All I'm getting to is, is that every thorn, whether it comes from life or it comes from um, uh, something that God allows or you know, a messenger from Satan kind of thing, every thorn has a lesson in it, has a purpose in it. That in Paul's case, he's saying it, it's keeping me humble. It's keeping me from getting conceited is what he's trying to say. Okay? Maybe, and I'll, I'll give, it, I'll give the, oh, I think the main reason is here in a second. Maybe it's just to remind us of something. Maybe it's to remind us of the area of our life where the thorn is that we need to uproot and get rid of. Maybe, okay, maybe the thorn is, okay, it's, it's, it's a relationship problem, and you're just, there's all kinds of relationship problems, okay? Well, maybe the reminder, maybe the purpose in the thorn, is it has nothing to do with Satan. Satan's not packing your marriage. It's just because you guys don't know how to communicate with each other. Or it's, it's ongoing debt, and every month is, oh my gosh, we're at each other's throats, and it's really stressful, and we don't know if we can pay the bills, and all those kind of things. Well, maybe that, that you know, whatever it is, maybe it's a lesson that God wants to teach you. And sometimes, this is a true statement, that when the lesson is learned, then the battle's over. That many times that the struggle that you're in is directly related to the frustration or the thorn that's being caused because we haven't learned the lesson that creates the thorn or allows the thorn to grow in our lives. We keep repeating the same cycles and the thorn loves that. And rather than surrendering to God, rather than trusting him, what those kind of phrases are, we just keep going through the same cycle because these thorns keep choking out the word of God. We hear the word of God here, but we don't see the word of God in our lives or the, the fruit of the word of God in our lives. You know, when I, I can preach a great message on trust, and I think, yeah, we ought to trust God with all of our hearts and all of our souls and all of our minds, and, and we ought to lean on not on our own understanding, but we ought to, you know, direct, let him direct our path. Like, we, yeah, it's a great message. But then on Tuesday, if I'm not trusting God, see, the problem is that a thorn, a care of this world, a worry of this world, choked out that thing, that message on trust. I mean, the word of God is true. It says we should not worry. The Bible says that worry is sin. Though the average person who goes to church and believes the Bible is true would call themselves a follower of Christ, they think it's okay to worry and that we don't see worry as sin. We see worry as normal. And if I say, but worry is sin, well, yeah, but it's normal. I've got this situation going on. It's, it's, what you're hearing is the thorn. You're hearing the voice of the thorn and it's driving out the voice of the word of God. The... God, see, the whole point is, is that it's not that worry is not normal. Worry is normal in my flesh. So the person with Jesus, you know, the Holy Spirit living in them, and the person without Jesus, without the Holy Spirit living in them, okay? Now, when we die, there's heaven and hell to deal with. But just on a given day, okay? On a given day, they're exactly the same in their flesh, just because you say don't make you nice. And just because you're not saved don't make you mean. You tracking? There are nice people who confuse their flesh being nice that they're saved. They're not saved, they're just nice. And there are mean people who have gotten saved. They've, they've chose Jesus to be their savior, but they've not let his spirit transform them from the inside out. Because if you're saved, you shouldn't be mean. Your flesh might be. You tracking? Like some of us are more judgmental than others. Okay, it's normal to be judgmental. Yes, in your flesh it is. But not when you're being controlled by the spirit of God. Do we have to separate out Tim or you in my flesh and Tim or you controlled by the Spirit of God. Because in my flesh, I'm no different than anyone else lost or saved in their flesh. And so what happens so many times is we hear and we believe right here. That is awesome. You know, it's going to the store, you get the um, tomato plant, 
You don't put the tomato plant in the middle of the woods someplace under some thorn bushes. Nobody does that because everybody knows you will not produce any tomatoes that way. There'll be no fruit. If your tomato plant survives, there'll be no fruit from your tomato plant. We take a tomato plant and we take it home or where we go to and we have prepared the dirt for that tomato plant. We don't even just dig a hole in the middle of that concrete hard dirt. We prepare the dirt for the tomato plant. We put the tomato plant in the dirt. We may even use things to hold the tomato plant up and to protect the tomato plant from animals or put cages around it, from animals or whatever we do. We water the tomato plant. We take care of the tomato plant. Why? Because we want the seed, we want the tomato plant to grow. When the word of God's seed is planted in us, we give almost no care to its protection. Almost no care to its maintenance, to making sure there's enough water and making sure there's a cage around to protect it from those that would attack it. Or the distractions or the briars. The weeds and briars of your life, just like in real life, the weeds and briars of your life will always grow easier and faster than the word of God in you. Just like, I can't grow grass but I can grow grass out of my concrete. You may got a problem like that? How's that happen? I don't know, but it does. Right? Number three in the outline. Some thorns are pullable. Others just need to even be embraced. Some thorns are pullable. I know pullable's not a word. Don't freak out on me. Some thorns are pullable. You can pull a thorn. And some just got to be embraced. Some things you can fix, okay? Now, let's use Paul's story. He's saying that this is a messenger from Satan that's causing this problem. That's how Paul said it, okay? The messenger from Satan causing a problem. Um, he says three times, he prayed about that, asked God to take it away. He's seen God do all these miraculous things. God did not take it away. And I'll, I'll read more in a few seconds and tell you what that's about. But he's, he's not gonna take it away, Okay. So in Paul's life, he needs to stop trying to pull something that God's not going to take away, and he just needs to embrace it. Does that make sense to you? And the reason he needs to embrace it is he recognizes God's going to do some pretty cool stuff in me, and he's going to use me in all these ways. And maybe the greatest deterrent of the work of God in me is my ego, because you have to remember, in his, Paul's flesh, he was pretty cocky. So if you go back to pre-meeting Jesus, okay, in like Acts chapter 9, okay, whenever that was, if you go back to pre-meeting Jesus, Paul was a cocky dude. Okay? His flesh was he lent toward being arrogant. Does that make sense to you? A natural tendency of his flesh was to be conceited about how awesome he was. And there's even places in the scripture where he told people how awesome he was. Okay? He had no problem explaining to you how awesome he was because he knew how awesome he was. So God gave him something, allowed him to have a struggle that was not going to be removed to keep him from being conceited. In that case, just embrace it, brother, because that's not going to go away. Okay. Some things in life are that way. Some things we can fix. We can pull them. We can manage them. We can resolve them. I talk about unresolved, unresolved issues, right? If your husband and wife don't communicate very well, you can learn to communicate better. Okay? You can learn things like showing respect to each other. Right? You can learn to be kind. Okay, so there's lots of things in life we can pull. There's, there's lots of thorns that we can resolve simply by being, uh, letting, you know, kind of letting the word of God grow in us and becoming a reflection of Jesus. Okay, there are some things that just aren't going to happen. And if we use my knee when I had that problem for a while. I mean, I don't know for years. I mean, I don't know, it's, I mean, six or eight, seven years. I mean, a long time. Well, in the middle of that, and obviously, it was pullable in that I had surgery, okay? But in the middle of that deal, I couldn't just go fix that. I couldn't read a book about that. Everybody had a solution. Well, if you just, you know, took this pill, or if you just did that thing, if you just did this thing, or none of the solutions worked, right? I just had to deal with it until it was going to be dealt with, right? You know, sometimes it's maybe something in your, in your, in your family, like a child, a struggle they have, right? And let's just say your child has a hard time um, learning math or whatever it may be, right? 
um, staying focused, whatever it is. Well, that's not, you can't just read a book and make that go away, right? That's just a part of your life now, right? Some of us have chemical imbalance things, right? And listen, I, I believe a lot of things that happen in our lives, um, God can resolve. Don't misunderstand me. But there are things that just, outside of a miracle, it's just not going to go away. Sometimes because we create the problem, but look, there's times that we don't create the problem. It's just that's the way it is. That's just my struggle, whatever it may be. You know, you got to have the wisdom to know the difference in the two. What's pullable? See, what's pullable, you have personal responsibility to work with, to resolve the unresolved. And what's just something you have to embrace? If it's something you have to embrace, then just embrace it. Like, I could have complained every week about my knee. I could just like, you know, but I just had to embrace it. I couldn't make it go away. I could complain about this. I don't know if you've noticed, my, I don't have much hair. But it's just part of my life, right? That's something I have to embrace. Now, I don't see it as a thorn because it doesn't take me as long to do my hair as it does you, right? <laughs> but let's just, let's just use that for a second, right? Is that it, I could... In, I, I have to make a decision. Is my ha- lack of hair, is that something I'm going to embrace or something I'm going to fight with the rest of my life? Right? Pick the topic, whatever we're talking about. You just got to pick her which one it's going to be. Is it something I can pull, something I can resolve, something I can fix, something I can move out of the way, or something I just got to embrace is it's always going to be there and I've, it's just my personal struggle. Now, I'm, I'll bring more help to you. Uh, number four, thorns can discourage you or drive you to God. Now, that was funny. Did you guys hear that? <laughs> For the Staunton campus, because you didn't hear it, someone very politely went out because they were being polite, but they needed to blow their nose, and we all got to hear it. So that's funny. <laughs> I got funny stories about that in my house, but I won't tell them. Okay. Um, it wasn't blowing the nose either, but that's that point. <laughs> thorns can either discourage you or drive you to God. Now, okay, so the thorns can be pulled, Right? Or the thorns that you just have to embrace because they're not going to go away. Either way, either way, they're either going to discourage you or they're going to drive you to God. Either way. Okay, let me read Paul again here. Verse 7 Because of these surpassingly great revelations, you're going to call them so awesome. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a message from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded. That word pleaded, I mean, it's, that's a stronger word in the Greek than it is in the English even. Pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Our title this morning, our one simple truth is, is that God's grace is always enough. That's what, you know, when God says my grace is sufficient, what he's saying is it's always enough. My grace is always enough. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now, do you believe that? I mean, it's one of those kind of things you have to decide. Do you believe that? Is that a seed that God plants inside of you today that you either protect or the thorns of your life will choke it out? Therefore, and it's because of that, he can choose discouragement. You see what I'm saying? There's an attitude change that takes place between, like say, in the middle of verse 8. Okay, going from verse 7 into verse 8 to verse 9, there's an attitude change. The attitude was, I got this thorn in my flesh, it's horrible, it's a bad thing, I'm really frustrated, I'm going to pray and ask God three times, I'm going to plead with God to remove this thorn because this thorn is a problem. And then he heard from God. And what he heard was, I'm not removing the thorn. Because I want you to understand that my grace is enough, that my grace is always sufficient that I want to give you these thorns. I want to allow you to have these thorns so you understand that it's in your weakness that I demonstrate my power. And Paul's whole attitude changed. Now, let me tell you what happened, okay? So Paul's complaining about his thorn to God. He hears from God that sense of peace that here's what God says. And all of a sudden, he received that seed, that word. And then he removed the thorns out of the way to deal with it. 
He's going to protect that. He's going to live on this word that says, you know what? And I'll, I'll read here a few more of the verses again. He, you can tell he gets almost excited about it. I'm going to boast all the more, he says. Because when I am weak, he is strong. See, the whole attitude went from, it's like instead of being frustrated with my affliction, with my thorns, I'm going to embrace my thorns. I'm going to walk through life with my thorns because it's in my weakness. God proves himself to be strong. Well, let me just read it to you. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And this is Paul speaking. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. In other words, I'm not going to boast. I'm not going to just not boast about my coolness and how awesome I am. I'm going to tell people about my weaknesses. So that Christ's power may rest in me, on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses. Nobody does that. No. I in insults in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, he had learned, he had learned a principle, a seed from the word of God, a truth from the word of God. And he planted it and he protected it. He was, that's what he was saying in that passage. Number five, thorns allow us to test and prove God's faithfulness. Thorns allow us to test and prove God's faithfulness. Thorns allow us to test and prove God's faithfulness. Um, every word, you've heard me say this probably countless times, every word that comes from God, whether that's to you directly, or it's through scripture, or in a service like this, every word that comes from God, according to scripture, contains the power to accomplish what it said. Every promise from Scripture is true. When God tells you not to fear, when God tells you not to worry, when God tells you to not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways to acknowledge him and to trust him and to follow his plan for you. When God gives you a promise or gives you a command or somehow he stirs your heart to obey him in some area of life, God's way is always better, going back to last week's message, and his grace is always enough. That it's in our weaknesses, not our home runs, that God proves himself to be strong. Now think about that logically for a second. If every time somebody saw me or saw you, we were hitting a home run, okay? And at some point in time, it's easy to say, well, they hit home runs, they're awesome. And it's easy for that person or a church to become conceited. Yep, we hit home runs because we're awesome. And then we wonder sometimes, why does God allow the struggle? Why does God make us learn things like endurance and perseverance and patience? Why does God make us work through the hard stuff rather than just giving it, making it easy for us? Well, the truth of Scripture is it's in those moments that he proves himself to be strong. That the only way we know that God actually is faithful is not because the Bible says so. How you actually know that God is faithful is because you've tested him. You stood on his word. You protected the seed or the word of God that he spoke to you or he showed you in Scripture, wherever it is, and you saw what happened. Not that you let this... Thorns grow up around it. Because when you look at the thorns, that's on you. And what happens many times is, we say, well, yeah, the Bible says, but I don't see that in my life. Well, dude, you got so many thorns around there, it's choking it out. But I'm telling you, you pull back the thorns. You remove the distractions. You give God an opportunity. And he will always prove himself to be faithful. Back in 1986, I started saying a phrase that said, Jesus never fails. And I had people, Christians, say, you shouldn't say that because sometimes, you know, he might. Nope. Not ever. No, sometimes he might. Well, if he does, then the Bible's wrong. 
Jesus never fails. He didn't always do what I want, maybe. Or maybe it's not always as fast as I wished. And what happens for most of us when we don't see God do, perform or do whatever it is that he's trying to do is because we get so caught up in the journey or the, the thorns or the struggle or the perseverance process, the endurance process, that we check out. And we don't get to see what God said he wanted to do. So I use our church as an example. And God has a vision and a dream and all that kind of stuff. And we speak that out. Some people buy into that. Some people choose not to buy into that. There's a place that um, if, you know, the church was growing really fast and then we lost 86 people because they didn't want that to happen, lost control, whatever. What if I'd have left then? I'd have moved on to somebody else. All I'd have done was create damage and cause a problem for the church. Does that make sense to you? And people would have said, well, that wasn't God. The opposite that wasn't God. It's a train wreck. And it's the people who bought into that vision, who really believed it was God, what if they'd all bailed? Let's all go someplace else. Let's all leave. Let's all drop out of church because, you know, it's not God. Some of you who've come to Jesus in the last how many years, wouldn't have come to Jesus. See, who this church is is not the result of some kind of really cool thing that happened, some kind of big explosion that took place, some kind of you know, moment in the sun where there's a home run hit and everything cool happened. That's not how it happened. Who our church is is based on this principle of persevering, of enduring, of trusting God, of walking in faith and sometimes just standing still in faith and believing that God always provides, that his grace is always enough, that his son never fails. See, the point I'm getting to, and I need to crap up, I know, is that you and I choose to receive and walk in God's grace or to reject it. We choose to receive God's grace and to walk in God's grace even when we don't feel like we're choosing. So when it feels like someone else is in control, when it feels like that the circumstances are in control, when it feels like that you just can't help it because you feel anxiety or you feel worry or you feel anger or you feel frustration or you feel stress or you feel whatever you feel, right? In the middle of what it is you feel, you think, I don't have control over this. I can't choose not to do this, or whatever that is, right? I can't choose not to respond this way. I can't choose to not walk away. I can't choose not to retaliate, whatever the thing is. Even when you feel like you can't choose, we always choose. I don't know what you're walking through. I need you to hear me, please hear this. Whatever it is you're walking through, God's grace is enough. If you'll believe that, if you'll let that seed be planted in you today, if you'll plant that, push that, the thorns away, if you'll deal with whatever it is trying to choke that truth out, because you're gonna have it, because you're gonna think, <coughs> No, it's not enough. I need this, and I need this, and I need... No, God's word says his grace is enough. It doesn't mean you don't need those things at some point in time, but you need, to get the, you need to get the priorities figured out. The priority is Jesus, not the stuff. The priority is trusting Jesus, not the thing you think you need. The, priority, the voice you need to listen to is the voice of God, not the voice of something else. That what you need is Jesus and his grace, his, his goodness towards you that you don't deserve is always enough. That he wants to give you peace, that's God's grace to you. He wants to give you wisdom, that's God's grace to you. He wants to give you hope, that's God's grace to you. He wants to give you whatever the thing is, he will give it to you. You and I are deficient. Our church is deficient. We will never have the ability as individuals, as families, as a church family, to meet the needs around us. That will never, ever, ever happen. 
It never happened. I don't have the ability to give you what you need from me. But God's grace is enough to me. You don't have the ability to do whatever it is. The church family, we don't have the ability to do whatever it is. We don't have the resources. We don't have the patience. We don't have the time. We don't have the energy. We don't have the whatever it is. But God's grace is enough. It's just what you want to believe. Think about my depression's overwhelming. I know. I know your depression's overwhelming. I'm not saying it's all going to go away. Your depression is in your flesh. It's not in the Holy Spirit. God's grace is enough. He'll get you through your battle. Let's make it, instead of your depression, let's make it my knee. God's grace was enough. Didn't mean it didn't hurt. Didn't mean I didn't, I didn't like it. Didn't mean it wasn't horrible every day. But God's grace was enough. I could have quit. Why didn't you quit? Because God's grace is enough. Why didn't you stop? Because God's grace is enough. Why didn't you lay down? Because God's grace is enough. And that thing in you that makes you want to lay down, that struggle in your finances, that struggle in your relationship, that struggle that makes you want to just quit and lay down, that thing that you're, I'm not saying it's not real. I'm not saying it's ever going to go away. What I'm saying is that whether it goes away, whether it doesn't go away, whether it's real, whether you're just kind of manufacturing it inside of your emotions, I don't know, I don't even care. What I'm telling you is, regardless of what we're talking about, God's grace is enough. It always has been. It always will be. And if you'll choose to embrace your weakness, and embrace your struggle, and embrace your brokenness, and embrace your frustration, your pain, that it's in our weakness that God proves himself to be exactly who he said he was. It's in our doubt that he proves himself to be faithful. It's in our brokenness, he proves himself to be a healer. It's in our storms that he proves himself to be the giver of peace. It's in the darkest moments of our depression that God proves himself to be a giver of hope. You got a voice you're listening to, maybe. Maybe that voice is telling you that you're a thorn is greater than your Savior. I hope there's another voice that you're hearing today. There's not one thorn, there's not a whole field full of thorns who compete with your Savior if you'll just let your Savior be himself in you. God's grace is always sufficient. Let's pray. Mary, Father, um, I don't know about this day. Maybe there's somebody who's having a perfect world today. But most days, for most of us, there's always something that's frustrating or something that's not perfect or something we wish was a little different. And sometimes those aren't little things, they're huge things. Sometimes they're paralyzing things. Sometimes we can't even get out of bed or we just don't want to. Sometimes we just want to give up because it's just, there's just so many things that aren't okay. God, I pray the day hope was spoke. I pray today a seed was planted that we choose to protect, that we choose to let grow. Because God, I thank you for a promise that is just as simple as your grace is always enough. And just now I pray, amen. Let's